today we're moving to South America and Kat Huggins, although yeah. Kathleen is, I don't think I've ever said that to you. I know, nobody <laughs> calls me <laughs> Kathleen. But there she is, um, is talking about her work, her work this summer in the field in South America on, um, on my project, which is absolutely wonderful in the Andes, and really her ontological basis probably for her thesis, so it's really exciting stuff and hope you Thank you. Full attention. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so thank you everybody for being here. I just want to briefly recognize that Monday was Indigenous Peoples Day, so I hope everybody was able to take time to sort of reflect on what that means for you individually or for us moving forward as a nation and sort of taking more time to um, acknowledge the indigenous peoples that we live with. So anyway, um, my name's Kathleen Huggins, and let's go. Um, so a deep reading of ethnographies from archeological research areas frequently leads to adoption of indigenous terms, and in that process, a reassessment or an abandonment of terms from Western anthropological canon. We can use this process of reinterpretation as a chance when we can also recognize that we have a position relative to these terms, which are often the structuring principles in our research areas. And we can review how our archaeological praxis and the communities we work in can change during this reinterpretation. In this presentation, I aim to demonstrate how a reinterpretation of indigenous Andean social concepts can be, uh, can be achieved by resisting the general outline of Mao's essay, The Gift. I emphasize that indigenous and post-colonial archaeology still follow in a Durkheimian and Mausian legacy of cross-cultural comparison and how we apply anthropological work to social policy. I'll attempt to demonstrate that we can understand an Andean model of reciprocity as distinct from Mao's model, one not based on economics or debt, but in a motif of domestication, cooperative care, and anti-individualism. And I want to underscore how this understanding has challenged archaeological theories as I apply them to my own dissertation research design. So basically, the presentation is going to go through translation theory, sort of a process of de-gifting the Andes, which is the reinterpretation of Andean reciprocity and entification. And then I want to look at how Andean theories challenge archaeological theory. And then I'll briefly introduce my future work, and I hope to do future presentations to explain this better to everybody. So, <laughs> let's see. The process of interpretation in Andean archaeology has been complicated since its beginning. In ceramics, for example, Inca jars, which are this one, <laughs> uh, are often called arebolos, due to an early classification which used the term for oil and wine jars produced in ancient Rome. In Quechua, these jars are actually called urpus. Yet today, the term arebolo has become tacitly accepted by Western archaeologists as well as Peruvian and Bolivian archaeologists. Though it seems rather harmless, just one word for another, these kinds of mistranslations and the importation of terms from Western anthropological canon um, come from a long history of really polemic arguments about the origin and diffusion of cultures into the Americas. Today, there's a deep resistance to this process, which is based on indigenous and post-colonial method and theory. For instance, we all know that the description of the Inca Empire as the Rome of the New World is absolutely cringeworthy, as many Mayanists can understand. However, when you look at urpus and amphoras, you can understand this initial problem. There exists some kind of recognizability which we can't help but acknowledge. What other term could we use for these vessels? How do we, you know, people who live in these distant places, in these very foreign places, communicate with people who have never traveled to our study areas? How else can they understand ceramics from an erased and conquered civilization, if not through terms passed down from a near continuous line of Western history? And I say this sarcastically. <laughs> I suggest that archaeology's initial desire to call these jars arebolos is because of a familiarity, not with these jars or between Roman and Andean styles, but with familiarity itself. As anthropologists working in foreign places, we're constantly butting up against familiar practices and modes of life, things which seem too alike to not be related or at least attributable to some kind of underlying quasi-universal cause or structure. 
In line with post-colonial anthropology, however, I suggest that we strongly resist this familiarity, not by outright cringing denial, but instead, whenever we feel something is too familiar to be true, I think we should dive deeper into it. In 1925, Marcel Mauss published an essay on the gift, the form and reason of exchange in archaic societies. Mauss described a number of societies participating in very similar reciprocal exchange systems, including the Haida and Tlingit of the Northwest Coast, Melanesian and Polynesian societies in Oceania, Native Alaskans and Australians. Uh, as well as Roman, Germanic, and other Indo-European legal systems from archaeological cultures. Maus felt that beneath so much cultural aesthetic variation, an archaic gift exchange system, or some variant of it, still remained unchanged, hidden, and lurking beneath the surface of most cultures, even <coughs> modern society. It's hard to deny that something like a gift exchange system does exist in many cultures, but I think we're better served and we do better by our communities when we fight against familiarity. And we go, um, and against directly translating every single instance of gift exchange as yet another variant of Mao's model. One way to think of this kind of direct translation in anthropology is that there's first an experience, the ethnographic experience. And after or during our participation in it, we author a translation of those events which gets at the core of the experience. No one ever really feels like we've covered every aspect, but we hope we've covered at least its core. This kind of translation, however, is incredibly difficult, and many linguists suggest it's actually impossible. In extreme cases, authors concerned with cross-cultural and epistemological comparisons suggest that these experiences don't even exist in the same world. In her book, Earth beings, Marisol de la Cadena demonstrates one way to resist direct translation, and she suggests that our tendency to react to familiarity by providing English translations of indigenous terms is a practice of equivocation. De la Cadena explains this by discussing the translation of earth beings, or terracuna in Quechua, as mountain spirits. This translation of terracuna as mountain spirit is not wrong, she says, but it risks an equivocation that leaves the earth being behind. I'm not talking about different cultural perspectives on the same entity, but about different entities emerging in more than one and less than many worlds. And their practices, they can overlap and remain distinct at the same time. I believe that direct translation of Andean forms of reciprocity and gift giving also leaves something critical behind. These Andean reciprocity practices are, not, are undeniably familiar to those of us who have already read the Melanesian and archaic examples which Mao's presents. But if we're not careful, this familiarity can lead to uncritical, uncritical equivocations. What De La Cadena says about earth beings existing in more than one and less than many word, worlds, <laughs> and also words, actually, and her use of the term equivocation is important to understand. Essentially, when we cite Mao's to explain indigenous reciprocity structures, we evoke them in English writing, and they emerge in our world as a distinct thing from the practice itself. In Viveros de Castro's discussion of equivocation, he suggests that every culture is a gigantic, multidimensional process of comparison, but direct comparability does not necessarily entail immediate translatability. Essentially, this is because translating cultural beliefs into anthropological concepts is a transformative process, basically creating a new thing, an equivocation. Equivocation is basically when one word or concept means two different things. This is, you, this is when the translation of a cultural experience and the actual experience have overlapping characteristics, sometimes even sharing overlapping terms. But they're still entirely distinct entities, epistemologically speaking. In translation theory, Quine writes that this pattern of overlap is because translation happens at arm's length. And further, that denotational equivalence, which is direct translation, said in another more complicated way, is either impossible or inherently flawed. As Quine writes, the uniformity that unites us in communication and belief is a uniformity of resultant patterns overlying a cha chaotic, subjective diversity of connections between words and experiences. While this is all theoretically heady, the idea of equivocation can help us understand why it can be so difficult but really so important 
to translate ethnographic experiences into satisfying ethnographic models. When we translate Andean reciprocity practices as Mausian, we run a risk of not looking carefully at the indigenous terms which we have been overlapping. As frustrating as this might seem, though, it's not a hostile deconstruction. In an actionable suggestion, De Castro proposes, proposes a form of controlled equivocation, and De La Cadena calls this slowing down the translation through a careful process of co-laboring and co-authoring with indigenous communities, not exactly rejecting equivocations as fallacious, but looking more carefully uh, for other shared terms, carefully connecting more parts of the experience together and examining those terms which we've already tacitly accepted as equivalent. I suggest we bring, bring this same kind of attention to slow translation into indigenous and post-colonial archeologies, span and also privilege indigenous concepts rather than using Western terms as sufficient explanations. But before I go into my own attempt at a slow translation of Andean reciprocity, I wanna make it clear that it's not my intention to trash Mao's entirely or look a gift horse in the mouth. Mao's contributions to anthropology and archaeology should be acknowledged, and from them we can also gain practical footing in post-colonial projects. In the foreword of the 1990 edition of um, The Gift, translated into English by W.D. Hall, Mary Douglas writes that Mao's followed a key tenet of Durkheim's designs for the social sciences, being that every serious philosophical work should bear on public policy, and hence, that the theory of the gift is actually a theory of human solidarity. Douglas suggests that the gift stands as part of a program of anti-individualism, popular in French authorship of the time. Though, Douglas reminds us that Maus and Durkheim argued for a more nuanced vision of anti-individualism, which, while it emphasized the reality and scope of rule-governed rule behavior, still encur encouraged political systems to allow for individual expression. Mao's work then put to the fore the importance of gift giving at the individual level, or otherwise the agential level, as it would later become known, in expressing and in fact actualizing social reality and therefore creating institutions, history, as well as common generosity and deep emotional bonds. Post-colonial archeology span shares Durkheim's vision of affecting policy change and Mao's palpable fondness for a theory of human solidarity, his search for the spirit of the gift, is shared by researchers who wish to engage in indigenous, community, and collaborative archaeology projects. For my own work, a slow translation of the Andean mode of reciprocity will also bear on policy, in so much as it's going to inform my archaeological praxis, including the questions I ask, the methods I use, and how I position myself and my work. The first step, then, in my research has actually been to explore ethnographic materials and to create a basic framework which I can take with me to the field to test, correct, and expand with co-authors and Sharipa. Yeah. <laughs> In the Andes, redistribution systems have been recognized since John Murrah presented his 1969 treatise on the vertical archipelago model. Murrah's model posits that Andean populations were able to cope with harsh climates and sharp changes in altitude by distributing settlements vertically across altitudinal microzones, where different products could be exploited and then distributed across the variable landscape. These populations were related often by kinship, community, or IU. For those versed in Andean ethnography, we know IU can be a sticky term, but for general reference, IU is a complex Aymara and Quechua concept which entails a large community, but includes livestock, landscapes, and topographic and non-human entities. Because of the great distance between communities, Murrah suggested that Andean folks still relied on an archaic, deep time system of reciprocity and redistribution. And Murrah argued that this system became the framework for most social rela relations and institutions in the Andes. For Murrah, this is why Andean, the Andean region doesn't seem to have a market-based economy, but is instead based on redistribution. Its greatest expression, for instance, was the system of storehouses along the Inca road, Capacñan. This interpretation of an Andean model of reciprocity then seems at first to follow the Mausian structure. It includes obligations to create perpetual cycles of gift and return gift within and between generations. And like Malinowski's Kula distribution model, a work implicitly related to Mausas, the network of Inca storehouses also created a highly formalized system of redistribution. But how profound is this equivocation? 
Looking at Andean ethnographies, it's possible to parse out a much larger and more careful interpretation of an Andean reciprocity model, which I'll begin to illustrate here. First, I propose that Andean reciprocity is actually structured around the theme of domestication. In indigenous Andean terms, this theme is uiwe in Quechua or uiwe uiwanya in Aymara, which roughly translates to rearing or domesticate husbandry. Marisol de la Cadena gives us an example of the uiwe theme as a central tenet of intra-action and mutual care in modern Andean communities, with the case of Nazario, a paku or a shaman, from the Cusco region, who became deeply obli obligated and essentially voluntold by his entire community to walk the grievance during the Peruvian agrarian reform of the 1960s. To explain how the Uiwe theme permeates Andean society, Oxa, another Andean scholar, tells us that respect and care are a fundamental part of life in the Andes. They're not a concept or an explanation. To care and be respectful means to want to be reared and to rear. This implies not only humans, but all world beings. We rear our kids and they rear us. We rear the seeds, the animals, and plants, and they also rear us. Hence, uiwe, or co-rearing, is the sense that the responsibilities of domestication render a unique reciprocity system, which not only moves goods and spurs ritual and moral obligations, but is the context, the structuring principle within which all entities are born. Important for my attempt here to create a structural model of domestication come reciprocity, De La Cadena also points out that uiwe um, is not necessarily egalitarian, but actually disposed to hierarchical organizations, allowing us to parse out spheres of responsibility and obligation to reciprocate with upper, lower, and central players. In a conversation with the Aymara linguist Juan de Dios Yapita this summer, who is also my Aymara teacher, um, Juan drew for me a basic diagram explaining that the mountain peaks are the uiriri, or the caretakers of humans, wild animals, and domesticated animals, but also that the humans are the uiriri of their own domesticated animals. From Denise Arnold's work on the role of houses, or uta, in tattling on misbehaving folks to these local mountains, it's also possible to parse out a relationship between the houses and the mountain, the Uiwiri Mountains. Though I don't know if they have a position of power yet, or if they play more of an intermediary role between the Uiwiri peaks or the Uiwiri humans, or even if it's possible to draw such a structural diagram from these kind of notes and observations. However, further from Ochoa's work on the terms for South American domesticates, we also know that Aymara and Quechua words for domesticate is Uiwa, and that different kinds of domesticates are then subdivided based on what specific goods they produce. All of these terms and the repeated use of the ui root brings linguistic support to the idea that domestication plays an important thematic role in the structuring principle of Andean communities, as well as the importance of what goods and services the members within such a structure produce and distribute. Briefly, looking closer at this linguistic data, it's important to emphasize that the root ui exists in both Aymara and Quechua. Aymara and Quechua are the most common and currently established indigenous highland Andean languages today. There were more in the past, but they are very quickly dying out. And communities in the Andes generally speak one or the other. Both are agglutinative languages with logic structures very dif distinct from the fusional languages like English. It's been estimated that upward the, upwards of 30% of Aymara and Quechua words share common stems, but both, words, uh, but both languages use unique affixes. This has been attributed to the pre prevalence of multilingualism in the Andes, which was reported at the time of Spanish arrival, and to such redistribution networks that Murrah uh, ob observed. The idea that both Quechua and Aymara communities emphasize who and what des the designated Uiwa and Uiwiri, or domesticates and caretakers, are in their community landscapes may be a strong indication that the Uiwe and Uiwanya structure is a kind of pan-Andean domestication-themed reciprocity model. Although, sorry, I lost my place. <laughs> Although it's an early sketch, this model of Uiwanya represents um, a glimpse at how different Andean reciprocity is from Mausian cases. For instance, in contrast to the Melanesian system based on economic reciprocity and gift exchange, the Uiwanya system emphasizes that reciprocity is motivated by the obligations of caretakers in the domestication process 
and the obligations of domesticates to in turn deliver goods upwards to their caretakers. Well, I prefer caretaker as a reinterpretation of the Aymara word uiwiri. Its more common use as guardian also indicates the kind of defense a farmer or herder provides to domesticates. In the Andes, even mountains can provide this defense. For example, the guardian mountain of Cuso, Ausangate, also known as the Rainbow Mountain, if anybody's seen those really great tourist photos, um, is known to have helped the Inca win a war against invaders by rallying local stones and boulders to their defense. Likewise, Yama herders must repel attacks by puma or wild dogs, and farmers must protect their crops from hail through apotropaic measures, or even simply scheduling sowing so that fresh buds don't emerge during hail season. Andean reciprocity, then, is not based on extraction or redistribution of excess goods for the maintenance of abstract power or social wealth, but the provisioning of goods, which were generated or gathered specifically to sustain that community, and the defense of your community members. However, you can ask, what exactly are those goods being delivered upwards to the highest guardian, the Uiwiri Tirakuna? Obligations to feed and respect Andean mountains have been interpreted as a form of ritualized animistic reciprocity, an equivocation with the obligation to redistribute goods imbued with the how essence which Maus describes. In the Andes, it's very common to create offering bundles which are burnt and said to be fed to Pachamama or to the earth or to other landscape entities. However, although they may contain small objects, these offering bundles are prepared not as packages of goods or as gifts, but as actual plates of food. Hence, these offerings are not gifts meant to bring the earth into supplication or indebtedness, but they're more nourishing feasts, just the same as the food domesticates provide farmers and that farmers provide to their domesticates. These offerings are meant to sustain the health and life of caretakers so that the entire system of co-rearing, co-caring, and interdependence can continue. The inclusion of animistic terms in Mao's model, such as hao and mana, has contributed greatly to its use in the Andes. But when we pull the Andean reciprocity away from a Maoian interpretation, we begin to see that understanding burnt offering bundles as efforts to nurture and fertilize the landscape underscores a critical point of difference between the Andean system and the Maoian model. This difference is that the powerful exchange goods we'd normally expect in a Maoian system, like the kula uh, necklaces and arm shells, which were, are exchanged in Papua New Guinea area, are not embedded in the Andean reciprocity structure. Indeed, much of the goods which move through Andean structure are basically foodstuffs. So we have to ask ourselves, is there Andean kula? Like Asangate outside of Cusco and other respected mountains, non-human agencies situated in the landscape can reward their communities with protection and benevolence. They can also have unique identities and predilections which cause harm. Small objects and non-human entities also have a kind of livingness, and this can be superficially similar to Mao's description of the agential power of objects containing how or mana. This essence, however, is called sami, which has been translated to breath. I suggest that unlike mana, Sami is not a mechanism of Andean reciprocity. Instead, the domesticate reciprocity structure is basically the context within which entities are instilled with Sami. Unlike the Melanesian Hao or mana, rather than building over time as the object is exchanged, Sami is instilled in bodies and objects through the practice of dedicated labor. For example, a popular description of an enlivened object is a common wooden cooking spoon, which Catherine Allen was told had the Sam, uh, an ethnographer working in the Andes, had, was told had the Sami quality because it was skillfully made, but also because it had been used for many years. Other living objects could be small engraved stones or even uniquely shaped rocks found near, near rivers, which had been worn down by erosional process, hence slowly crafted by the landscape itself. In Quechua, making a special kind of enlivened thing is understood as kamai. Notably, other words exist for making in general, but kamai is a specific synonym used in the case of enlivened objects. Contemporary skilled makers are referred to as santoyuk, but linguists suggest that this term is related to an Incaic position of kipu readers, uh, kipu kamayak, kipu being the knotted string system which we believe uh, was used in the Andes as a form of writing. This is discussed by uh, Catherine Allen, who writes that Santiyuk are the skilled craftsperson who work under the guidance of a saint. This saint is asked to guide the person's body through the steps of making, but also to guide the ingredients that the maker is working with. 
to allow a, sex, a successful imparting of form to matter, and to allow the possibility that the Sami quality, the breath, will emerge in that object. The saint's guidance in this way is to do what has been done before and can be repeatedly done, but with help. To work well is to successfully replicate the actions of a teacher or another skilled person. While the ability to impart breath, or to kamai sami, can be requested from either uiwiri or from saints, there is still an emphasis on repetitive labor even in requesting this assistance. For example, Catherine Allen's descriptions of the Santayuk or skilled uh, craftsmen includes descriptions of the crafters um, deriving their talent from a close relationship developed over many years of trial and error, as well as constant communication with the crafting saints. According to Allen, Santayuk will regularly murmur quietly to crafting saints while they work. As well, Peter Wogan, in writing on the what he describes as a misinterpretation of reported equivalence between writing and weaving in the Andes, which is an equivocation I'd love to go into, but can basically be summarized as they're both hard, and then that got translated to they're both the same. Um, Wogan tells us that children learning how to write offer samples of work to a local landscape-situated saint. The same saint which weavers learning their craft also offer pieces of similarly tedious and difficult work. This could suggest that the... Oh, I skipped ahead of slide. This could suggest <laughs> that the, the same saint which Weaver, ah, I lost my place, I'm so sorry. <laughs> the shared attribute of difficulty and, this suggests basically that the shared attribute of difficulty and repetition are very important to Andean craftspersons and it's also contained within the Uiwanya system. Um, and we also need to emphasize that there's a lot of emphasis on the need to consult and communicate with landscape entities during the learning and crafting process. Uh, many ethnographers go on to also suggest that the Sami qu quality produces an inextricable link between the maker and the maid. Objects not only contain and are constrained and defined by the physical stuff of the environment that they're made out of, but they also maintain a communicative link with the environment despite distance. So reflecting on the sense that co-rearing, or uiwanya, is implicit in the uiwanya reciprocity structure, and the habit of skilled makers to communicate regularly with landscape-situated saints, this communicative link may be because the originating landscape is considered a legitimate co-maker and co-author of the object, and through skilled work has become actually part of that object. If we're to look back to Mao's, in this case, Sami is less like Hao or Mana, and more akin to what Mao says is the underlying moral component of a gift, which is that to make a gift of something to someone is to make a present of some part of yourself. Nope. Um, so now I'm going to move into how this all kind of reflects back on archaeological theory. So I'd like to suggest that by slowly translating powerful objects as outside the reciprocity structure, explanations of how objects gain the quality of Sami can present examples of an indigenous theory of technology. And better yet, they can illustrate how indigenous conceptualizations can teach archaeologists to mediate some of our stickiest theoretical debates. An Indian indigenous theory of technology can, for example, present a synthetic definition of technology which challenges our internal discussions concerning agency, specialization, and representation. In regards to agency, I think it's incredibly interesting when we position the Sami quality in conversation with the idea of experiential matter, which is proposed by process relational philosophers, like Whitehead. For Whitehead, experience happens all the way down at the atomic level as phenomena or events. Consciousness is the result of a body which is further uh, organized to experience consciousness. And as Whitehead suggests, the many become one and are increased by one. For Andean peoples, while this is likely familiar, it's not at all a universal truth. Many identical objects vary in importance and power based on who made them and how they were used. So this kind of concept for consciousness or agency is only qualitatively true when certain demands are met. A Sami full object is not enlivened during the process of being made, but instead at the success of being made. Be because Kamai basically indicates making, the Kamaiing of Sami mirrors a practice theorist definition of technology, which emphasizes agency. But unlike agency or even object agency theories, the Sami quality can vary in quantity and forcefulness. 
Agency is a binary. You either have it or you don't. Power is the one that varies in, in quantity. The success of imparting Sami into an object comes not from that object's becoming, but in being well made and used. The Sami quality only emerges from felicitous events, rather than autopoiesis or self-organization. To be enlivened, animated, to have undergone the process of identification, however we choose to interpret Kamai, Sami is a marked quality attributable to real, in-the-world practical variables, which include the influence of the environment, the skillful gestures of a maker, and how an object participates and is useful. The linguist Bruce Mannheim argues that subtle logics in Quechua allow us to formulate uh, reformulate irritating object agency theories as kinds of cooperative entification rather than explicit consciousness or agency, which means we can read concepts like Kamai Sami as complex philosophical statements about how value-laden identities, which look like and are discussed as consciousnesses, can emerge. Looking then at specialization, which is my favorite way to look at Kamai, we see how this instantly reframes the specialist character which we commonly build up in archaeological narratives. Access to technological knowledge and specialization are contained in the Kamai Sami theory, but with an emphasis on replication and repetition, which is very similar to many popular definitions of technology, especially those associated with mass production. But in archaeology, this modeling of technologies through nonlinear operational sequences is most similar to what Goron and Le Monnier suggest. Just as Andy and Santa Yuc place their bodies in the force of saints and co-create in a reactive and hopeful gestural flow, we archaeologists model specialists as acting out operational sequences which can start, stop, pause, or even be abandoned as other sequences intervene. But because of the co-creation implicit in the Uyuanya structure, we can no longer think of singular specialists, but always as groups working together, even if that group includes only one human. Um, and finally, looking at the idea that entified objects remain in communication with their makers, both the humans and the landscape, we also gain footing on stressful theoretic theoretical debates in archaeology about representation. For example, in behavioral, uh, behavioral approaches to archaeology, we identify object attributes as indications of the behaviors of the maker, or otherwise as physical representations of the and the vestiges of the act of making. However, in Kamai Sami, these are continuous connections to a range of co-authors, human and non-human. The Sami full object is an indexical trace rather than a symbolic or representational signature of doing. Andean discussions of Sami can really help anthropologists and archaeologists revisit and acknowledge common laxity in the way that we use obtuse and loaded words like sign, signature, index, icon, and symbol. But to slow down, it's not my intention to directly translate Kamai or Sami as Persian or even as semiotic, but again to outline that these are independent indigenous theories which will help inform my research. In summary, in strong contrast to Mao's model of how or mana as a driving force of redistribution, the Sami qualities of non-human entities don't appear to drive Andean reciprocity. Rather, Uyuanya reciprocity is the context for entification. By teasing out this difference, and by pursuing this familiarity, we can see an emphasis on trial and error, which tells us that investing in repeated labor as well as repeated attempts to communicate with Uyuiri underscores the creation of enlivened, potent objects. With all this in, in mind, I'll now translation, uh, transition to how this Uyuanya system and the related Sami Kamai dynamic has very directly influenced my praxis as I prepare for dissertation fieldwork. First of all, I accept that Uyuanya obligations are self sustaining relationships, and that the act of generosity and reciprocation is also self defining. These are those virtue qualities I've mentioned a couple of times. As I've come to understand it, the obligation to sustain your caretakers, enacted in the form of offerings to mountains and home shrines, is akin to an Aragon in Aristotelian virtue ethics. And we know Aragon most normally in the term ergonomics. An Aragon is an action or function which defines that object or person, basically. So a person cannot be runa, or Andean folk, without doing the actions of a runa. Hence, the obligation to cede labor, goods, or words to Uwiri is that runa's Aragon their definitional virtue. As archaeologists, this means that when I'm invited, 
I'm not only obliged to participate in community meetings, but that participating in those meetings is one of my own definitional traits for that community. Put another way, we're not expected to attend, but if we don't attend, we're not archaeologists. We can't work with that community. Second, I understand that Kamai Sami, our Andean theories of technology, emphasize the role of trial and error, as well as communication during crafting, especially those crafts which require arduous and repetitive labor. This means that taking time to talk with community members and taking strides to learn Aymara can help me in my own labor as an archaeologist. Also means that trial and error are forgivable and pretty much expected, so long as I continue to talk with my teachers. Further, because Andean reciprocity is not a form of economic exchange, but a critical aspect of the self-sustaining Andean community, I recognize that the Uiwanya structure demands that the product of my labor in turn provisions and aids the labor of others. When we don't provision communities with the goods that they helped us produce, we work against the flow and we inevitably face and inflict hardship on other people. Further, the goods that I produce should be useful to the community. My results should be at least as useful as the wool produced by Yamas. These tenets of research are, of course, the basic tenets of collaborative archaeology. But I believe that having arrived at these insights through a post-colonial approach to reinterpreting Maoisian terms in the Andes will let me find my place not based on adding even more Western terms concerning ethical commitments, but rather that my commitments will come from an actual desire to understand and listen to Andean communities. So, <laughs> getting to the meat. Um, at this point, my project essentially divides into two primary sections, being an ethnoarchaeology and an arts conservation project in Shariba, and a study of early formative ceramic materials, which uh, I use a low-cost, high-resolution photographic analysis technique. Um, and I'll do this briefly because I know all of that just took up a lot of time. Uh, my ethnographic project aims to study and conserve a form of basketry making practiced in Turaco Peninsula, which is, sort, which is my research area, which is situated along the shoreline of Lake Titicaca in Bolivia. Because of the wealth of modern tools and materials in the area, many traditional crafts have disappeared from the contemporary Bolivian highlands, even as the region excels in the production of indigenous agricultural cultures, namely potatoes and root vegetables. Still, some elder farmers in Turaco continue to produce a special form of woven grass, grass basket, which is made out of ichu, a type of high altitude bunch grass. Over the summer, I was able to work with one basket making household, Luis and his wife, Christine Tarkey. Luis told me that few youths know how to make these grass baskets, which are specially woven with netted bottoms for sifting the dirt from root vegetables during harvest. And I have one up here if anybody wants to see it. <laughs> Um, this basketry process is endangered by the teaching of reed basketry in local schools, where children have been trained to make animal-shaped basketry, which appeals to the international tourist market. More than a loss of an art form, the possible disappearance of Ichu basketry will deprive future, agri deprive future agriculturalists of a zero-cost craft, which has been designed over generations to efficiently sift dirt from root vegetables and to withstand heavy use. You can this is almost inflexible. It's a very, very sturdy form of basketry. It's a useful tool. The disappearance of so many traditional arts also inhibits the study of ancient craft technologies by archaeologists. I was able to work with Luis and take some videos, and this is just a zoomed in of Luis kind of working through some of the later lashings in the basket. As well as conservation, my ethnographic project aims to study this basketry production as a way of accessing the social organization and especially modes of conversation and communication which happen during crafting. As an archaeologist, I'm interested in the first technologies used in the Taraka Peninsula, a setting which eventually gave rise to the Tripa formative complex of sunken ritual courts and the later expanse of Tiwanaku culture on the other side of, from Tripa which would go on to inspire Inca and modern state mythos in the Andean region. Understanding how contemporary basket makers observe their environment, and how they discuss with their neighbors about micro-political relationships during basketry production, can help us to model how early forms of craft production could have created arenas of political discourse. I believe this is a unique chance to not only pursue ethno-archaeological research, but even better yet, it can contribute to the conservation of an indigenous basketry making technique. 
My project will provide videos and images of elders speaking in Aymara about their experience as basket makers, their personal philosophies and ideas about the importance of crafting. And I plan to pursue the project as soon as possible because I hope that these are the experiences that are going to give me a better chance to listen and discuss perspectives on technology and how things like the Sami quality can emerge during the process of dedicated labor. I also want to work with elders to formulate operational sequences of their work, asking for their input and interpretation along the way, engaging in the co-authoring which Maricel de la Cadena suggests. These sequences will be useful for archaeological analysis of basketry tools and production processes, but are also immediately beneficial for teacherless training pamphlets uh, for schools and individual learners in Sharifa. This summer, I was also be able to begin working on ceramic analysis technique using low-cost, high-resolution photography. Essentially, uh, my plan is to study minute surface details for a form of semi-automated quantitative analysis using false color images generated through RTI, which is reflectance transformation imaging. Um, using these false color images, I will put them into cell counting software and begin to basically do things like PCA analysis or discrimination analysis and look at these, uh, these surfacing techniques in, in finer detail. This summer, I was able to collect over 200 sets of photographs of early formative and middle formative ceramics from Charipa. The RTI capture process entails a fixed camera and object with lights rotated between photographs and a reflective sphere, which is the round object you see in the photos, which shows a bright highlight spot. Similar to photogrammetry, which uses geometry to reconstruct a 3D model, RTI uses the sphericity of the sphere to construct a polynomial texture map, which is a static view, which is what we're looking at right now, which is a, a static view of an object with dynamic adjustable lighting. With high resolution photography, this means we can re-examine photographed objects under dynamic lighting conditions, getting us one tiny step closer to being able to hold an object in hand without actually having it in hand. And also, and I feel this is very important, it lets us invite more collaborati collaborators to interpret our materials especially remotely. Uh, the purpose of this study has been to expand the documentation and analysis of surfacing techniques beyond observational notation. When we put them on operational sequence diagrams, surface treatments uh, on ceramics are frequently represented as just a single phase. However, when we study archaeological ceramics, we see every stroke of a burnishing stone or swipe of leather as discrete gestural units of time. Hence, the topography of various, various surfacing treatments actually signifies various intensities of time, if you think of it that way. And if we return briefly to the Sami Kamai discussion, we know that the intensity of labor dedicated to an object could be directly related to an investment by the maker of the Sami quality. In more general archaeological research, this can also tell us about tooling and very specific processes of surface treatment. Expedient quantitative analysis of these various surface topographies then can enrich operational sequence diagrams and it works really well with extensive attributional analysis which has already been done in Taraco by Andy Roddick and Lee Stedman and I'll continue to do with new materials as I'm able to get to them. Um, more than going beyond description, improvements to the analysis of ceramic surface topography illuminates a creative environment in the past in the same way that the basket making project hopes to give credence to the political impact of creative spaces. While often represented as a bubble and a diagram, the time spent burnishing ceramic is really super dense with action. It's a compressed time of repetitive and monotonous action where one gesture blurs into the next as easily as the former and the non-linearity of productive labor can be seen and heard. Burnished ceramics are like quilts in a knitting circle and they were audience to the kinds of social interactions which reinforce ties, circulate gossip, and hash out political grievance and agreement. Bringing surface topography into a larger project of attributional analysis and archaeometry can help us understand the relationship between production of objects as well as political objectives. To be honest, it's really hard to avoid feeling that even with a slow translation, my archaeological epistemologies have simply found a, vivid, a set of vivid similes and mnemonic devices for understanding indigenous <laughs> explanations of the world. 
My goal here, though, is to operationalize these indigenous theories so that I'm not just trying to understand an indigenous position, but to let that indigenous position actually guide my own interpretations of the archaeological record. As I'm sure everyone's seen, the most recent issue of the SAA archaeological record is dedicated to archaeologies of listening. The authors of the title article make a great point, which is my final point, that as archaeologists we work with empirical data, and our strength in interpretation comes not from experimentation, but by reflecting on our own prior experiences. They suggest by listening to indigenous and community partners, we not only respect these people, but we actually and pragmatically become better archaeologists because we gain wider and wider insights on cultural and natural phenomenon which directly aid us in our methods of inference. This is why it's so important to me that ethnographic fieldwork is the first step of at least my own archaeological work. Overall, the gift reminds us that it's no gift is truly freely given. As an archaeologist interested in incorporating indigenous theories and concepts at the beginning of my research, I know that I'm always receiving a gift every time that I'm the one talking. So even today, all of your attention is a gift. So thank you all very, very, very much. <laughs> Um, questions, suggestions, comments, giant flaws, please, everything, anything. <laughs> June? Um, it's okay. Um, the, um, RTI is an interesting toolkit, and as somebody who's tried to look at the series of finishing techniques on ceramics, mm -hmm. um, I was thinking, okay, full, first off, super cool. We love talking more about that. Yeah. I'm also wondering, have you thought about how some of the data that you're generating from that process may lend itself to um, some description of defining the sites that you're at? Because as, as a zooarchaeologist, I think of pseudo cut marks, mm -hmm. straight marks, trampling, yeah. bones, right? Because you're working with ceramics, you're going to have. Um, survivorship of your artifacts in ways that we wouldn't as well. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And maybe some of like the heavy duty stuff that looks like that ain't finishing work. That's some that that got stuff up, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe there's is there some is yeah, doing yeah. work on, on using that to um, not, not that I know of. RTI is generally used for sort of petroglyphs, and it's actually very, um, very popular with lithicists because it aids in sort of speeding up the drawing process for like micro seriations and things like that. Yeah. But yeah, it, it would pick up taphonomic processes on just about any surface. And I have used it on one bone object, um, one that I actually suspect is something like um, a, an, a yaori, which is a type of needle used for making these kinds of baskets, and it worked just fine on the bone. Although, the, because RTI basically captures uh, curvature, because that's what it's really showing, uh, if it, bones are always pretty curvy, so it, it's about doing a series of RTI over a whole surface. And I am hoping to teach a, um, workshop here on RTI so I can talk way more about it and it's very simple, very approachable and basically a free technique. The software is free. So does that answer your yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and the ARF has yeah, we've invested the ARF has invested a lot in trying to get um, all of the tools and equipment for RTI so that we can all sort of figure out how this is going to be useful to us. Any other questions or Nico? Yeah. So, um, you mentioned that that Indian exchange was a, at least in the contract period, it's not thought to have had a market based supply and demand mm -hmm. uh, basis. And I'm wondering if uh, you thought about how maybe Kamai's Sami and Kamai, Sami, yeah. It would contribute to understanding how it would work instead of supply and demand based. Like I've heard that it's maybe prices were fixed by tradition. Yeah. Sort of like the Troike system, where like mm -hmm. there's equivalencies that are built up. Yeah, but then there's also mm -hmm. some kind of like a baker's dozen at the Yapa. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, the yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the, because some, uh, Sami has been talked about as being sort of that thing which is in the object which makes it 
part of a landscape, even if it moves away. It's sort of, it's sort of part of like Little Cusco and things like that, that there are parts of the um, Andean landscape that are actually distributed across the wider area. That I guess that could actually be another explanation for why, if they do have a market system, it's not a market system. Yeah, it's very hard. I, I think it's probably hard to come to a translation of their whatever exchange system they have, though, if you start with a market interpretation. I think maybe beginning, yeah, with Sami and Kamai and thinking about the fact that they have this sort of distributed agency, if we want to call it that. Um, yeah, that would be actually an interesting thing to kind of tease out. Because it does mean that there's a continuous connection between the purchaser, the owner of an object, and the maker slash landscape where that object came from. Yeah. Anybody else? <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> thank you guys. <laughs> I'll let you all. <laughs>